introduction and then Andy will end with his uh, uh, real life use cases. Right? Um, the pizza will be delivered around uh, 7 p.m. so please <laughs> hold on. Um, the beers are in, in the in the fridges so hopefully it will be good. There is also non-alcoholic beer uh, for you to drive so feel free to, to help yourself with that. Um, okay, so let's start. Okay. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay, guys. L like it's written here, my name is Chris of Crea and I'm the chief software architect for Dynatrace, actually one of them, because we have several of them. And I'll be telling you a bit today about profiling distributed applications. And yeah, let's start. It's not working. It's not working. Okay, it's working. Okay, first I'll mention the whole APM thing because this was kind of the topic for today. What the hell is APM? Uh, then I'll try to dive into examples of distributed apps, which you might already know. And together with that, I'll try to see what kind of faulty components we can have there. And then I'll try to focus on 10 things which we can look at uh, when we are dealing with such applications. So uh, yeah, let's start with APM. So it's very simple, application performance management. So uh, I won't dive into it much more because uh, I think Andy will tell you more about it. But yeah, that's basically what we do here. We kind of know a bit about it here. So uh, talking about applications, uh, here we have a standalone Java application and yeah, let's think about the first uh, distributed app which comes up to my to our minds. Actually to my mind, the first one which came in, it's an application which deals with a database. It's already distributed, it can be on the same host, it doesn't have to be on the same host, but yeah, uh, that's how, how I see it. If we want to get a bit com more complex, it's very common to have a web page nowadays and yeah maybe it's not so common to have uh, Java right in front uh, of users so that's why we have an nginx here so en nginx is quite 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 fast quite good so everybody wants to have it so we will also have it in our presentation and yeah as we are a bigger company and yeah we are thinking about doing something with multiple teams and so on, it can happen that we can have another part of our application which is based on .NET and yeah, which is using some SQL server. And as we already have some data here, it might be sometimes convenient to do such a hack, which is not always good, but I think Andy might uh, tell you more about it later on. And yeah, as we have this Nginx which is uh, handling some stat static content for the web page and Node.js is quite popular right now so let's assume we have like two Node.js nodes and yeah they are they are doing some Mongo DB stuff and again we have this problem here actually it's already a problem that we have two of them because you, you can scale it different but yeah let's see and as we want to have a modern uh, setup we also want to have a uh, front-end as an app, whether it's an iPad, whether it's a uh, phone, uh, whatever. Uh, you, you can have it running through a phone gap or something like that so that yeah, it goes directly, mo most commonly, directly to your Nginx. And yeah, as you might know, it's very convenient to have some third-party content uh, stored inside your data center because, yeah, it might be faster. And, yeah, as we already mentioned that, you can have some of the components within your data center, but then uh, it's actually not that good visible, but we have this famous internet clouds here. So uh, that are things which are 
network connections which are not under our control. So we can say that this part is within our uh, within, uh, within our data center, and the other parts are kind of parts which we cannot control completely. And yeah, as we want it also to be a bit more more modern, yeah, we can have this in AWS because it's convenient. Why not? And yeah, sometimes it's all also happens that within AWS we have a VM running. Yeah, and within our data center we want also to experiment with our uh, guys the new technologies. So we set up everything within Docker containers. And yeah, as you might see, that is already a bit complex because debugging or profiling such such a small application, uh, it can be easy, it can be hard, but here you need to multiply it by so many components. And yeah, these clouds, there are also things which you can, need to take into account. And th there are several things which can go, uh, go wrong because even if the whole thing here works, you can have issues here because you're deploying JavaScript app and you can have an error within the JavaScript. So when we are talking about uh, application performance, we cannot talk only about the uh, kind of uh, server backend. We need to also think about the front end performance. So it's also quite convenient to have something here which checks the performance. And as I already mentioned, that is quite complex. And imagine what happens if we add continuous delivery to it and we don't do it the right way. Yeah, we can have continuous health. And yeah, there are ways you can do it right, but usually you need to do the switch. And in the beginnings, it's not always easy. So uh, so, how can you get an illusion that uh, it's actually uh, something which we can control? So, I would say maybe by doing this free, uh, these 10 things which I will mention in a moment. So, the first one, uh, if you're uh, dealing with a distributed app, it's quite convenient that you sync uh, the clocks between the components. I mean, uh, whether it's uh, physical nodes, virtual nodes, uh, it's quite convenient to have the same time on them because uh, you want to see the whole picture and not only components. I mean, uh, not only problems on one node, but correlated uh, components. Uh, the next thing, uh, watch logs. And it's not only about watching logs like you do for a traditional uh, app, which is standalone. But it's more about collecting the logs within one place so that you can watch them. So we already have uh, common time, and now we have the logs in one place. So it's much easier to reason about uh, what's what's happening if uh, if you have it in one place. And there, there are plenty of tools which you can use. Uh, I have three of them here, like some logic, Splunk, and that's Logsash. Uh, yeah, we we are also doing such, such such a thing within our company, but yeah, uh, maybe later. Uh, next thing, uh, which is quite convenient, it's quite convenient to actually know how the whole components are connected together, because uh, without knowing that, you are kind of in the dark. You only know that there is one node which is misbehaving, but you don't know uh, how many nodes are really affected by it. So it's it's very convenient to be able to do uh, to draw such a map or diagram of of your application. Uh, however, nowadays this already becomes a problem. Uh, that's a screenshot from our uh, software, which is doing such uh, profiling monitoring thing, and that's actually uh, the diagram of connections between services at a customer. And yeah, you can already see that. I have this diagram, but you need to put some work into knowing what actually happens here. So the, having a diagram is not, not always helping. Uh, the next thing is to know the dependencies between your nodes. So uh, we 
can have a Java application which goes to a Oracle database, and it's it's nice to know that it goes to this Oracle. But it's also nice to know whether it ain't such a thing, because uh, it can be like that that this Java application actually doesn't have one connection to this Oracle, but multiple of them. And that's something which you should be aware of. Uh, next thing uh, is about grouping the traffic. Uh, by this I mean uh, not looking at one node at a time, but at kind of a transaction, because uh, it's easier to see how, how the components are uh, dealing with each other. So, for, uh, what we can do in order to, to make this uh, be grouped? Uh, the easiest part is cookies, but cookies have this problem that, uh, for example, when we have such an, a configuration, that can be a REST call. So the cookie won't be forwarded here, right? So you need to do something in order to, if you want to have a transaction uh, from the part which was here, uh, actually to, to this part here, you need to pass somehow uh, some identifier. Uh, we call this tagging, and yeah, for HTTP it's pretty easy. You just uh, add an HTTP header, like here for Java, and you're good. There are also some other uh, services like queues, uh, where it's not so easy, but still makeable. And that gives you kind of the view from, um, from the logic, how, how it logically works together. Uh, Another thing is that it's quite convenient to be able to see the world, how the browser sees it, because it can be like that, that we have uh, uh, multiple calls with the same cookie, but for, for different transactions, because the, the user is using di different uh, uh, tabs within his browser, or even different, uh, yeah, uh, different tabs, I would say. Uh, so next thing which we can do and that that's actually a wrong slide because that's something which you should do uh, anyhow um, for standalone applications I mean uh, the ones which which are not distributed so uh, you should from time to time collect back traces and based on that uh, do some statistics and see whether there are some hotspots and yeah for, for Java it's quite quite easy with Visual VM, there are some tools. You can also use some GMX for that. And yeah, for, for native, uh, w something which I would start with, which, I, which w if I wouldn't have any tool, I would just do some scripting together with uh, with the debugger to see whether there are some hotspots. Uh, next thing is uh, network. I already mentioned that there are some places which we can control. Uh, like within our data center, but there are also some uh, outside of the data center, and we can try to monitor them. And things which we can look at are actually the size of the traffic, because it can be like that, that for some strange reason we are sending a uh, lot of traffic, which which is not really needed there. So it's, it's convenient to look at that. Uh, retransmissions, uh, network latency, round trip type or uh, window size. Window size is, for example, something uh, which is quite popular to be a problem when it comes to mobile devices because sometimes it's like that they j just cannot receive and it, it the app is slow because the phone is slow, for example. It cannot receive data. So that, that's also something which is uh, quite good to look at. Uh, next thing is that it's quite convenient to have uh, an idea of uh, how long the DB calls take and how long they take for different uh, queries. And yet the easiest you can do is just yeah write your own uh, monitoring stuff. But you can also use some libraries which are out there on the internet. And yeah, something which which is quite important is to remember to also monitor in case of exceptions so that it's not like that that we lose the data which uh, which was started. But yeah then we got out by, by an exception. Uh, the next thing which we, the, I mean, at this point is about looking at the database from application side. And this one is about looking at, at the application from the database side. So uh, many 
many DBs have some performance metrics like for Oracle that are these V, v tables, V dollar tables, where you can find some uh, performance data. And you can also have a look at execution plans, whether it wouldn't be a good idea to introduce an additional indexing or something like that. And yeah, you, you, usually there, there, there is some stuff to look at. And last but not least is uh, watching the infrastructure. And it's, it's both about uh, physical stuff, like uh, your physical host within your data center, like also uh, like about the virtual, virtual, virtual ones, and yeah, also about the cloud. So there are plenty of tools. I, I just mentioned a few of them. So uh, th that's Monit. That's such basic monitoring which can uh, switch uh, Apache off and on again if it uh, catches that there is a problem. And yeah. That, that, that are actually a components which we also see at our cost customers because we are doing, uh, I would say, all of the stuff which I mentioned uh, within our company, but still we find customers which are using these additional tools. Uh, yeah, and what if we have all this in place? Uh, the, the thing is that if you have all these 10 uh, steps after you, it would be a good idea to have all this data in one place. I already mentioned this with the log files, but uh, all the other stuff, if we put it into transactions, it would be good to have it in one place. And yeah, nowadays, we can have a Kibana, and we can try to reason about it. We can create some dashboards, we can add some baselining, look for hotspots, create alerts, and most important, we should also hope. Because uh, even if you have all this in place, you can have a lot of dependencies. And that's actually a screenshot shot from, from our software. And it's captured uh, from, from a customer. And usually on, on this thing, we are able to show you what's the faulty component. And we are actually able to show the faulty component here, but still, uh, the amount of data which is here is so big that it's very, 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 very difficult to reason about it. So, yeah, that was my part. If you have questions, I think we can follow up later on after all presentations. I'll be around here. Knock, knock. Can you hear me? Knock, knock. Who's there? <laughs> okay. Uh, so. Okay, it's working. <laughs> so my name is Greg, and, or Grzesik, <laughs> or whatever you like, and I'm monitoring Hero. <laughs> So I work as a software developer here in Dynatrace. And uh, today I will talk about APM in pre-production. So I will just start with an, with an example. Let's assume that we have a web page, for example, e-commerce store. And the most important or one of the most important features in, in our uh, website is the search bar. So it's really critical for us to, to search to work and of course we have an integration test for that and the test is working everything's okay and boom somebody just broke broke it and the integration test is is failing for several subsequent builds 
and yeah we we saw that we asked the guy who who broke it to to fix it and he fixed it test test this uh, once again green uh, everything is okay all tests are green we deploy to production and boom everything just just exploded we get uh, complaining customers the servers are overloaded and we have really a bad time <laughs> and why is why is that because we uh, we did only functional testing and we forgot about non-functional problems and uh, in this in this example the problem was the uh, amount of uh, number of uh, sql queries because the yeah it's common for developers to fix tests in a quick and dirty way just hack something around to make tests passing again and uh, it's it's really common that developers just introduce that uh, that just bugs that are not the functional bugs but performance problems and this this performance regression is really really a problem and this is the the thing we should we should monitor and uh, here is a small screenshot from the uh, feature uh, one of the features of our monitoring applications so basically the idea is that we measure the here for example it's it's the execution time or response time for the tests and after several executions we get a corridor so we know something around how how this test should behave because yeah, it's it's time and it can always differ from from many many different uh, things but if it really pops pops up and doubles the value it's it's wrong and it's really important to to know about it and know that something is wrong and we can get this knowledge in pre-production not in deployment as as i uh, showed so yeah how can how can we prevent that from from happening i will start with the pipeline because uh, the the pipeline i will just explain it what it is for some some folks who might not uh, know about it so the developers are coding just, just creating the the programs and when they do some some part of the work they commit so developers commit to some co kind of code repository it's often git or subversion doesn't matter and later in a if we have pipeline we have that commit triggers a build and we have some kind of build automation continuous integration tool that might be Jenkins, team city travis quick build bamboo there are really a lot of of uh, different different applications that can do that for us but the the core, the core idea is is the same in each case we uh, compile the application that in this newest version committed and execute its unit and integration tests to know whether we have a, a build, whether the build is passing or failing did the developers uh, did the developer did something wrong and uh, after each build we get artifacts which for example if it's java it's the jar library we can execute and deploy to our application server or, or whatever and we often hold it in artifactory or some some other application and after building we trigger a deployment and here it's really a lot of different tools we can deploy it to docker we can deploy it to aws using puppet chef it's really a lot of different new new technologies but after we successfully deploy the application to the uh, pre-production environment we deploy it to production and write to our customers so that's that's what we call pipeline <laughs> and the the thing is that it's really hard to improve what you don't measure so it's important for us to to measure the that performance metrics uh, not only during the uh, not only on production but also in pre-production and that's where we kick in with APM tools we can plug the APM programs not only our Dynatrace but any other APM tools to uh, 
continuous integration tool to monitor deployment and of course to monitor production. So the typical non-functional problems is the number of DB queries, the number of web service calls, API calls, JavaScript files on page. It's really surprising how, how many JavaScript crap can can find can we find on on different web pages. So it's really one worth monitoring because it affects significantly the page load time. Also the number of, of exceptions I mentioned page load time and one that I will talk more later, lack of visibility in, in code. But how can we how can we fix that? We can just monitor application not only in, in production but also earlier in pre-production during the build and test deployment and it's really super important to deliver feedback early to back to developer from from the pipeline because if we commit something that for example like like the one that I uh, mentioned at the at the beginning the uh, breaking the search bar if we would get uh, feedback after 10 15 minutes after commit it would be really great and uh, then it would be easy to to fix and if we know about it uh, sorry uh, a week or two weeks later when it pops out on production it's it's really complicated and the, the blame war begins it's not me it's Bushek and I didn't break that and etc <laughs> so it's the early feedback is really super important and uh, also I, I would say it's really important to fail fast and fail often which which means that there, it's not a goal to have always green build we want to build to be red to be broken as um, as often as it needs to because we care about the performance and we don't want any performance degradation uh, yeah and that's that's all and we can we can prevent uh, prevent bad commits to get merged to the master branch and yeah understanding code and environment complexity it's really really important and now i have a question to you uh, is there anybody who ever worked only with the code he wrote he or she wrote, of course <laughs> so so all of you is working with some legacy code that somebody else wrote and you have to maintain it and deal with all the bad things that you found there Am I right? <laughs> yeah. So that's 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 a problem. And to be honest, in in that big, really big applications, the developers often have no idea what's what's going on. And it's also where the APM tools can kick in and help developers understand both code and environment complexity. And here, uh, on the thing we call transaction flow, you can see how the application really looks like just from the from the user is using the desktop client and the call is going right through some to some web server where it later goes to some java server and to database and really the apm tools can do that automatically all you have to do is to plug the uh, correct library to each node and everything else just is is just done automatically yeah and uh, that was the really really big picture and we can we can go much deeper and here is something we call pure path the basic idea is that we have some kind of uh, stack trace but it goes through all different nodes and technologies so we can we can track the user request uh, from from the from the yeah, web request that user clicked in his browser right down to the database call going through a lo load balancing and to web servers so it's it's really cool uh, yeah and that's all from my side thanks hi it's on perfect so before I get started I would like to have, I mean, you already asked a good question about who owns, who is responsible for code that you have not developed. 
right? I mean, unfortunately, that's the way it is. Or fortunately, sometimes we inherit good code. Often we don't. Quick show of hands. Who of you is developing every day? Writing code? Who is responsible for running code in production? Who is on call if something fails? Yeah. Sorry for you. I'm sorry for you. I'm sorry for you. You get an extra beer later on. Who is on the testing side? Who is testing? What type of testing do you do? What type of testing do you do? User, so manual, automated, or both? Do you care about performance too? Yeah. What is what is performance for you? Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other thoughts on performance? The other guys that raised their hands, or even the developers, operations. The operation guys, you, you said you're responsible for operation, right? Yeah, you, you still? <laughs> Are you, do you care? Do you get, somebody tells you if something is slow, and then is this something you worry about? Because otherwise you would probably have unhappy users, right? And maybe lose money and stuff like that. So I want to give you a quick intro who I am. Uh, I'm Andy Grabner. I've been fortunate enough to work in a performance field for 16 years now. And I've been on the testing side. That's why I asked them testing questions. That's why I was interested in it. I was actually started as a tester on a testing product. And then I switched over to Dynatrace because I wanted to figure out which problems do our customers and people that build Small apps, but also big and distributed apps, what problems do they have and which problems do they need to solve, especially when it comes around performance and when it comes about impacting end users. I'm also fortunate enough to speak at different conferences. I just named a couple of them where I recently presented. Now, I don't want to give you a full product pre uh, full presentation of conference papers because uh, if you want to see a full presentation, there's a lot of YouTube videos out there where you can watch me jumping around and doing things. Um, but I think I want to focus on the critical things, what I believe where APM actually helped people like you in the day-to-day -day life, but also in operating or making testing better. I want to start with why performance, and I think you already answered the question. One critical aspect, I believe, that has nothing to do with performance as we perceive it, but maybe what you said a little bit is, we see a lot of companies going towards more rapid deployment models, which means performance from it's much, it, it, it allows me, to, I'm, I'm allowed to go much faster from, I have an idea until the problem is, until the feature is out there. We have a lot of examples from companies like Cars, Flickr, Ads, and Amazon. Now, this is great. There's also some other companies that are not US-based. I'm not sure if Otto is known here in Poland. It's a German company, retail store, old traditional company, but they also manage to go from monthly to 250 deployments per week. The guy who actually gave the presentation I took the picture of, he's working for ThoughtWorks, which is a very well-known company, I believe, in the consulting business. And they, do a, they help a lot of people actually reshaping the way they develop software. And this guy was part of the testing team, actually, that helped Otto to, first of all, break apart the monolith into smaller services and then also become much faster in deploying. But here's the thing. It's not only about deploying fast, it's also deploying something that is fast. Is anybody working in e-commerce? Is anybody working for a website where you sell stuff online? Yeah? You can also show, raise your hand. It's, yeah. So you care about these things. Performance, there's a lot of studies out there where performance impact conversion. Most of you didn't raise your hand, right? Because you're not working in e-commerce. But we always hear these stories about e-commerce. But performance is still as important. Because if your software is slow, it impacts your end users. I just take an example on my case. I Every day I use Jira, which is you know, from Atlassian. Uh, I use Microsoft Online, unfortunately, sometimes. Uh, I use other services, and if they are slow, they make me less productive. If you are building software and you're installing your feature and your users are using it and they are impacted by it, then they're less productive and they get frustrated. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they go to your competition. So. It's about response time. In e-commerce, it's easy with conversion. Now, when we talk about performance, I want to 
give you different different things that we and with we I mean our industry, the APM industry we live in, are looking at. One thing is actually we look at user experience because I assume most of the software that you are writing is used by a user, right? Maybe you have some batch jobs that are not used by a user, but a lot of applications these days are used by some type of user. And therefore, we actually look at user experience. It's a key thing. We want to figure out, hey, what's the load time? Is there an error rate? So like I think you mentioned some examples, if you open up a page and it's super fast, but it tells you, sorry, come back later. Or if, the, if, I, if your browser says a JavaScript exception happened, then that doesn't make your user happier, even if it's super fast. So we, we factor in things like load time, error rate, and also bandwidth. And what we do in the, as an industry, and this is nothing that Dynatrace came up with. We as an industry talk about how can we measure user experience to figure out in very, and I'm sorry to use this word, I hope there's no managers in the room, but how can we come up with three very easy to understand colors that tell even managers that something is good or bad? Green, yellow, and red. And then we can do things like if we have the IP address, and if you look at things like Google Analytics, I'm sure we, we are already aware of this. We can look at the IP address. We can figure out where do people come from. Then we can actually see where are my end users. They are not even in Poland, even though I thought we are, we are we're doing something for Poland. Oh, they all come from some strange country, and they all hit us with denial of service attacks. There's a lot of things we can do. Or we can figure out where is it here, hard to see. What type of browsers do they use? Look at that. They're still using Internet Explorer. We hope these times are over, but they're still there. Right? They're still running on dial-up connections. So we can, we can draw a lot of conclusions about what, who our users actually are. And if we figure out most of our users are on dial-up and they're using still Internet Explorer, but all of our developers are using the latest and greatest Mac with a Safari, then we talk about performance from the wrong direction then we need to force ourselves, even though it's painful, to actually use the same software and hardware and connection that our end users are using. Simple as that. Starts with us. So, green, orange, and red. And I'm sorry that some of these colors don't come out on the projector. I think you, when you showed the transaction flow, it actually didn't look as impressive as it actually is, but maybe later in my demo I will do something. Um, Here's an example that actually happened to us internally. So we internally at Dynatrace, we also monitor the performance of our end users, which means people that go to Dynatrace.com, that go to our community, that sign up for our SaaS-based offering, that open up a ticket and support that runs also on Jira, but it's public. And what we do, we monitor things like how many users are happy, green, orange, and red. It's very important, so we know how many people are on there. For our SaaS-based offering, where we try to get people actually to sign up for our free version of the, of the product and hopefully later buy, we look at conversion rate. And why these numbers are interesting, dun, dun, it's good music. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it's another beer for you that you pay us later. Thank you. So here's the thing. This is the timeline from April 25 until May 4th. What happened on May 1st, our marketing team started sending an email campaign to get more people to go to dynatrace.com and see what cool new features we have. What they are interested in, the marketing team is interested in how many people are on the site and what is their user experience. Are they all happy? Because that tells them if the marketing campaign works well. What was also interesting is on day two, on day two they noticed on May 2nd that the number of not so happy users is actually much higher than on the first day and they also in the morning saw a drop in conversion rate as compared to the first day. And they said, so what do we do? Keep, do we keep sending emails? Or should we talk with the web engineers and make it a little faster to make them a little happier? And now the power of metrics comes in, the power of monitoring. But monitoring is not only about performance, but as I said earlier about user experience. I'm pointing at you now because you're in the first row. Let's assume you fixed the problem. And on day two, on, on, on January, uh, May 2nd, you deployed a hotfix. Unfortunately, that hotfix actually had a total wrong impact. The number, the red spike goes up, the green one goes down, and conversion rate goes down. That means what you actually deployed somehow had a very negative impact. The real story behind this, what happened here, we deployed an update of jQuery because we thought there's a, there's a better version, there's a minified version that makes everything faster. Unfortunately, that version that we deployed had a bug on every single Internet Explorer user out there, and there are still a lot of them. 
And that's why they couldn't even log into our new service. That means frustrated users dropping conversion rate. Fortunately, because we have a pipeline, what you were talking about, we could quickly fix the thing and then we were basically back on track. But this is also the power of metrics. Another thing, performance example, uh, this is an, an environment where uh, time frame June 26th to July uh, 8th, this is from an environment that automatically scales up and down. So depending on load, we're just adding additional EC2 instances or whether you, when you use Docker, maybe it's Docker, whatever it is. In this case, it was EC2. On July 3rd, we deployed an updated version of our software, actually not including any new features. The only thing we did, we updated some third-party libraries that we use. We use a third-party dependency injection library for logging. And that version that we upgraded to, unfortunately, had a memory leak. A memory leak in Java means more memory allocated, more memory allocated means more garbage collection. Why this is great, it is actually bad. Why? Because it means the same code that ran much more efficient yesterday now consumes more resources. If you run on an automatic scaling system, maybe your system automatically makes sure that no end user is impacted. But if you don't look at this, then at the end of the month, you will have to pay too much money to Amazon or to Microsoft or whoever runs the cloud. That's why when we talk about performance, we start even thinking more and more about how efficient is the code that we are writing. So every engineer, you should think about not only how cool this feature is, how nice it looks, how many bytes do I send over the wire, how much memory do I allocate, how many round trips do I have to the database. Because if your software runs in the cloud somewhere and then you need to pay Amazon, the, the, more, the less efficient it is, the less money you actually make. Does this make sense? Yeah. Another example, this is from, an e from another e-commerce provider. Uh, what they are, a lot of our customers are actually using us, uh, fortunately, in a load testing environment. So before they go live, they load test. And what typically people do, they run loads, and again, it's hard to see, but here's kind of requests coming in from load testing tool. It can be JMeter, it can be whatever it is. One, two, three, I think 10 nodes, and then going back to the database. This was the behavior under regular load. And when people prepare, or when, when our customers prepare for peak load, they typically test with at least twice the load or whatever they expect. So let me ask you a question. If you expect twice the load, what do you expect this picture to look like? In a perfect scenario, if you add two, twice the number of requests, what do you think it should look like? Come on. Instead of 10 nodes, 20. Okay, perfect. In a perfect world, unfortunately, this was not a, not a perfect world. So what they were basically doing, they were increasing the load and they actually saw when they have twice as many people on the system, their system didn't scale. It actually required 48 containers. That means the more users they were adding on the system, the slower the system became. And the more resources they need to add on it to keep the same performance. That means every user makes the whole thing more expensive. Root cause, interestingly enough, log4j. Who would have known? I wrote a blog about it. It was an issue in the, in the distributed logging of log4j. The more people that were trying to hit, the more, the more instances that were launched, there was a synchronization issue and basically it just multiplied itself. Another thing that I like a lot to look at uh, is what is the impact of performance to user behavior? User behavior means, if I look at you now, Right? If you have fun with playing with your phone and you're clicking around, you're probably very fast and you do a lot of things. If things are slow, you change your behavior. And this is the same is true for our community portal. So we actually monitor uh, our confluence that we use to host our documentation, YouTube videos, and all the other stuff that we have out there. And I'm, I feel responsible for the community because I started the whole thing eight years ago. So what I want to know is where do people click to when they are happy, so when you are in your cool mode and you're clicking around because you find your answers, and how does your behavior change if you are less happy and actually getting frustrated? And this is very powerful because we can now all of a sudden see what the performance impact of user behavior is. And what we noticed, if confluence is slow, you are not clicking on the cool videos that I created, but you're actually clicking on open support ticket because you cannot help yourself anymore because that's what I intended with my videos but you click on open up a ticket and that's not good. Now this is my example. Other examples if you're writing a feature and maybe you want to become experimental and you say 
maybe we get more people attracted if we change the color from green to red of that button. You can actually test this out. You can do A-B testing and by monitoring your end users where they click to and what performance they have from the browser as you suggested and monitoring from the browser and we visualize it in that way, it's very easy to see has, does it have a positive or negative impact. Okay, very powerful. So these are some examples. Um, how do we analyze performance? I think you mentioned uh, when you talked about uh, how we are tracing uh, calls. I think there's a lot of metrics that we need to look at. Uh, I liked your reference to Back to the Future with syncing your wall clock times. Yeah, it's very important. So there's a lot of metrics that I believe we all should look at. And there's also a lot of tools out there. Um, I'm typically presenting this at conferences and meetups as an independent, so that's why I want to give credit. There are so many tools out there and, and a lot of tools can do a great job. And if you don't have a tool yet, look at what's around. If you already have a tool, whether it's New Relic, AppDynamics, maybe a Ref, a Dynatrace or Datadog or whatever you have, then use these tools. If you don't have anything, all of these tools also have free trial offerings. And use them to look at these metrics. Now, when I get involved in analyzing application performance, I typically have to say that not here is the door, but here is the door. If you believe performance engineering, in most cases, is about optimizing a method execution time from 0.02 milliseconds to 0.01 millisecond. In most cases of applications that I've seen, this is not the reason why a big application cluster goes down it's typically much simpler. Okay, What I'm looking at is things like this. This is my number one favorite dashboard I build with most of my customers that come to me and say, I have performance data, but I have no clue what the problem is, and please help me. So here's what I do. The middle line is load. How many requests come in at a particular point in time? If you have a web application, you can get this from your Apache server logs, from your IIS logs, whatever it is. Because you want to know, how is the load behavior? On the top, this is response time in this case, so performance, and obviously we see there's a spike. But because I see also load, I can see that this spike is not load related. We are not under attack by anybody. It's not because 50,000 more people went on a website. The color coding on the top, this is something that we provide and that we all that you can obviously that you can also achieve with other logging frameworks, but we provide this out of the box. We color code and tell you in which layer of your application is most of the time spent. And we call it web server, app server, database layer, and we layer it. Because then I can immediately see the red layer is most likely the problem. And the red layer in this case, if I find it somewhere, it's hard to see, but I think it's the database layer, which is why I have the bottom chart. The bottom chart shows me the number of database queries that are executed. You mentioned this in one of your slides, what is the number one, what are the, the, the things we look at? Number of database queries executed. So we can immediately see all throughout the time, number of database queries executed were flat, except here. Number of database statements went through the roof. And it turned out at this particular point in time, they were just executing some very heavy database intense reports. That was then impacting all the rest as well but the root cause was to be found on the way the database was accessed. It was not load related. Okay? And it also would not have helped if I called in all the engineers and said, please optimize your method execution time from two milliseconds to one millisecond. It wouldn't have helped either. Does this make sense? Has anybody ever found a database related problem in their application? Yeah? Yes. Who is using Hibernate? Who is using Spring? Some other OR mappers, yeah. I'm sure there is, as powerful as these frameworks are, they're also very, um, you have to be careful with them because they can do a lot of interesting things. Right? So one thing that I do and the, and the reason why I have, hopefully nothing broke there, no? Everything good? Yeah. Um, I have a lot of this, so what I offer in my job, which I'm, I'm happy that my managers uh, or my boss actually allows me to do this, I offer a free service where people can send me their performance data. Because if you don't look at performance data every day, it might be a little hard. Which metric do you need to look at? I do this every day. For me, it takes minutes. 
So I have a program that is called Share Your Pure Path, and Pure Path, you explained this, is our data set that we capture, but I also had people sending me their load runner reports and sending me their stack traces from other tools, so I don't mind. Um, but what I've seen from this, from, from, from all the stuff that people send me, that it's really always the same problems that people run into. And I, I assure you that the things that you mentioned, the number of database queries, exceptions, and all that stuff, all of you guys, maybe if you have not written it yourself, maybe you have inherited it from somebody else, your application is also suffering from the same thing. Now, I want to quickly go for one demo use case. I know it's a demo, but we built our demo app based on all these problems we've seen with our customers. I'm not allowed to reuse, let's say, a PayPal or an eBay, even though they're customers from ours, but I'm not allowed to do this. So we just built something. And let me try this. I hope I'm not messing up my screen now. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm sitting all day. So let me just quickly see if this works. It's a duplicated. Perfect. Now I just need to make sure that I'm still recording because we want to make sure this is recorded. It is. I guess it is. Perfect. So uh, what I have here on my system is a little sample app that we wrote that reflects a very common thing that people do. It's a travel app. Okay, so just to understand, because you talked about the distributed tracing, we built an app based on the components and tiers we always see. It's an Apache in the front for load balancing, two JVMs, two CLRs, two databases in the bag, and a native component for credit card authorization, and a beautiful web front end. So what I can do, it's a single page app. So I'm, I'm here on my local, on my, on my standard page. I am from Linz, Austria. And I know some folks have been to Linz, Austria. So if I click on Linz and I click on search, then I always act very surprised because I've never seen the beautiful sandy beaches. I think the only, we have a sandy beach in Linz on the Danube, but it's not as blue and purple. Um, but nevertheless, I click on book now. And so I'm going through the regular flow. And what I'm doing here, I am actually using my schizophrenic other personality, Monica. I'm obviously using this because I will assume it is a demo. So here's two things. I click on login, and it takes one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. You said people will complain, right? So in the modern days, I'm not sure how it is you, but in the modern days, I would go to, to probably if I would be Monica, what do I do? I go to hotels.com, right? I go to my competitor or booking.com or what other site, what is popular here for online booking? Bookings.com, okay? So, okay. So basically, I just lost a potential customer. And maybe if Monica is really cool and hip, she will probably go on Facebook and tweet about it. That Easy Travel is the worst application ever, and it's always been bad, and that's why nobody will will like it anymore. If I would be a tester, where's my tester again? That's my tester. If I would be a tester. Then I will probably, while I'm waiting, I would start opening up a Jira ticket or whatever you use and start typing in, I did this and this and it's slow and here's a screenshot. Okay. So with an APM tool, and again, whatever it, it is, you can do this thing here. You can actually, if I can write correctly, I can log in to my APM product. And if I would be operations responsible like you, what's your name? Carlo? Carol. Carol, not Carol. Carol. So Carol, if I would be you, then you could first of all see, hey, I see Monica complaining on Twitter or on Facebook. Do we have a general problem, yes or no? Where do people come from? I can zoom in, right? I can go into, into Poland and I can see, now Poland in general, it's not that bad, even though we don't have a whole lot of users, only seven right now. So maybe we need to do some, some more work. Um, but overall, even though performance is not perfect, the only people that seem to be really having an issue are the, are the Swiss people. Are the, yeah, the Swiss people, but who cares about them? But this is one thing. So we can say overall there might not be an issue. But actually, let's have a look at the Swiss people. So there's three people from Switzerland, and we can actually figure out who these people are. So this is kind of like analytics type of use case. What you normally do with Google Analytics? Uh, these three people 
one of them is happy, two of them are frustrated. We can see that one of them is probably coming in with a mobile browser, browser another one with a regular web browser, the other two ones, they all use Firefox. So you can do my analytics. And what I can also do is if I want to focus on the frustrated, I have one frustrated user from Switzerland, I can click on inspect filtered visits and I can actually see this guy using Firefox 27 only did one thing, probably he only did one thing because the one thing he did was taking one minute, I will probably also leave, right, if it's that slow, but I can actually click on visit details and I can also see what did this user actually try to do. This user tried to load that page and it really took 96 seconds. What's interesting though in his case, most of the problem seems to be related to network. The server, our server is actually not that bad. First party and third party content is extremely bad. Oh, you know what? This user is actually using a dial-up connection. And remember our beautiful pictures on our website, they are high resolution, probably really big. So maybe our website is not really optimized for dial-up connections. But it's nothing that my developers just caused as an issue. Now what's nice is because we have all these details, I can also go back and if you're the operations guy, maybe somebody calls you or Monica calls you, you can actually say, let's have a look if Monica is actually what she did. Because what APM tools, what you can also do with logging, you can actually capture not only where's the user from, but you can also potentially capture the username when they log in. We can capture it from the HTTP parameter, from a method argument, whatever we want. And it seems Monica has really split, split personality because I can see she's coming in from Germany, from Santa Monica, but I think this is my user here. My Monica from my local machine. And then I can say, show me the details. I can see, fortunately, I had a broadband, so that shouldn't be an issue. But what, what now these APM tools provide, and again, this is not something that only Dynatrace does. Other tools do that too, but this is so powerful because now as a developer, as you, as the operations guy, you can actually say, look at this Monica complaint for a real reason. Are you that excited or falling asleep? <laughs> so she loaded the page. She clicked on L-I-N-C, clicked on links, clicked on search book. Now when she clicked on login, it really took 25 seconds. And guess what? The problem is purely on our side. It has nothing to do with the CDN first party. So that means this is something I want to then tell the developer to look into. And not only do I know that, I also see the complete click, click path. And what's beautiful now, I can actually say open in client and uh, accept the XSL certificate. And now I'm switching over to something that hopefully makes you as developers excited because now as a developer, I also get to see Monica, what Monica did, but in much more granularity. So you talked about the pure path. So what I really see now is for every single click that Monica did, starting with the loading the initial page, we are capturing all the details that you would normally see in the browser. Right? I think you had this also in your slide, uh, starting with the browser view. So we browsers that support W3C navigation and resource timings, we capture all this information. So I see this for Monica clicking on that link, clicking on L, I, and C. These are all HX calls. And then the login. This is really where obviously, and excuse my language, the shit hit the fan, as they call it. This is where we can really see that it was really slow, 24 seconds. And you showed the transaction flow, what we use, and all the other tools, New Relic, App Dynamics, they also do the same thing. We basically now visualize, so let's have a look as a developer what actually happened when Monica clicked on login? She came in on the desktop browser, went to the web server, to the JVM front end, one call to the back end, and then 970 database queries just for logging in. It's a little excessive, huh? So we have all this data, we see how much time is spent, and this is one of the number one problem patterns that we see. It's, it's, it's just too many database queries. And the real root cause is not just 973 different database queries. We can also go to show database calls. And I know it's a little hard with the resolution, 
but there are actually only four distinct SQL statements. And the first one is a store procedure call that was called 438 times, and another select statement was called three, 533 times. That's the classical M plus one query problem, the same statement being called all over again. And if you have an APM tool in place, not only does it stop here, you can go back to your, what you showed, the pure path, because the pure path now not only shows me where the statement was called from, but I can go all the way up in my tree and I can see, oh, okay, this was the web request that came in on that URL on Apache, went over through the load balancer, went into the first JVM tier. We called the method uh, authenticate. That was our authentication layer. Made another web service call over to this authentication service. And this is then where all the crazy stuff started. Okay, so this is the level of visibility you get with APM tools. And I believe what we call is tag and tracing. I believe tag and tracing is the new debugging. Because if you build a distributed app that starts in the browser on a mobile device and goes to multiple hops, especially microservices, it doesn't make sense anymore to debug one component anymore. You need to understand the full end-to-end -end flow. So tracing is the new debugging. That's what I believe. And you can either do it uh, following your best practices, manual tag and tracing. It's all possible. Or use a combination of tools, put everything into Splunk or Elasticsearch and make your analysis. Uh, or use look at the tools that are available out there. Make sense? Yeah? Cool. Um, good. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, I know I'm actually out of time officially, right? So I don't want to keep you for too much longer. I just want to give you something along the way. And I want to make sure that I'm still sharing the right screen here. I think I still do. Yeah, perfect. So what I've learned over the years with analyzing all of these, um, all of this data that people sent us, that 80% of problems that cause websites to either be slow or impact end users or cause tremendous amount of um, costs because of bad CPU implementation and bad coding are only caused by a very small number of, of problems. Right? It's always the same things. So I love metrics. Some additional use cases to, so that you believe me, Pepsi, right? I don't make this up. Pepsi.com. If you go to Pepsi.com during the Super Bowl, they do some very interesting things. They force you on the mobile website to download 20 megabytes, 434 individual images, right? That's not good. That's against everything that is out there. Another thing, so, so look at web performance. Another thing, what we learned, and not only we, but also Rebel Labs, who did a study, most performance problems are, in fact, on the back end on when it, when it talks to the database. Slow database query, too many database queries. What else do we have? Slow DB. I'm sure there's some connection issues as well. So some of the tips, if you have never done it, try to talk with the operation folks, the guys in ops or try to talk with your DBAs and try to figure out what are the slow database queries and where are they called from and what can you do to make them faster, whether you can change something in your code or whether they can do something on their side. But one, up, one problem typically is either one single select statement that is slow, another big problem what we've seen earlier, excessive SQL statements. Remember what I showed you earlier with my 900, that's nothing, this is 24,000 database queries for generating a little report. So very database heavy. Uh, another example, again, the M plus one query problem actually happened to us at Dynatrace. We are using Hibernate to generate some reports on our e-service portal. And this was no problem at all when this table that we had only had 10 entries, but it grew over time. And it was the M plus one query problem. So the more data was in the table, the more the loop went to query and more until a point where it was just unbearable for me. So database problems. Logging is another key thing. I mentioned logging multiple times. Logging is great. Please use logging, but use it wisely and make sure you're using logging frameworks and versions of logs, like in this case, uh, a bad log4j library, a version of log4j that has concurrency issues and therefore impacts performance. All of these, uh, we, I think we share the slides later on, I assume. 
all the slides have links to blog posts where I write about what the how I found all this stuff and which which uh, uh, log4j library. Another thing, log4j, same thing. Uh, sync time in call appenders. Uh, exceptions, you also had exceptions on there. Exceptions are really cool, but they're super expensive because every time you are throwing an exception, at least in Java, Java fills the, stack, the, the exception stack trace because you may want to use the stack trace to log it out. In this case, fill in stack trace, that's the method that actually gets called when an exception object gets thrown, consumes most of the time. Okay, so this is something, figure out, and, and, and it might not be you, it might be libraries that you use and you never see these exceptions because they never make it to log file because it's just handled and it's just like ignored. That's why I'm also a big fan of this chart. I chart the number of exception objects being created and the number of log messages that actually are a result of exceptions. And if I have a ratio of, what is it here, two to three log messages within five minutes, but at the same time, 40,000 exceptions, then something is probably wrong, but I never see it in a log file because the frameworks that I'm using, like Hibernate or anything else, is just hiding it because typically it goes back to a default implementation. Most common things are something is wrong, wrong in your config files, it tries to read the property, fails with a number format exception, then just goes to a default and it tries it all the time. So very common. And now really the last thing, it's just another microservice example. I know I showed this earlier today for those people that have been here, but this is an example where we have a call coming in in the front, making a call to the front end implementation that is supposed to render, it takes first of all an awful lot of time. The front end was supposed to run in Amazon's EC2 regions in different regions around the world, but it made a direct database connection into the backend database in the backend data center. It was basically querying a, hey, give me all the primary keys of my objects. And then in the loop, the M plus one query problem in the loop, it said, now I'm calling microservice calls for every single search result. So it's another classical M plus one query problem, but now instead of the application to the database, it goes from microservice to microservice. And if these microservices are distributed around the globe, then this is not good. It is slow. And it's also a lot of data that now gets sent over a network that is owned by Amazon or Microsoft or whoever your cloud provider is. This is very expensive. Okay. So these are all things we, we find a lot out there. Um, if you want to learn more, these slides and other slides I at least have on my SlideShare account. If you want to try, if you want to give Dynatrace a try, there we have a, a free version for developers. We also have, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about how I use Dynatrace on a day-to-day -day basis to find certain things and the rest is also, I think, self-explanatory. Exactly. And I'm sure we'll post these, these links later on somewhere. Yeah, that's it for me. I think the pizza is here, I guess. I, at least I smell it. <clears throat> yeah, of course. Yeah, I hope this was useful too. Unless there are questions to Andy. Oh. <laughs> so the question was how many entry points to get this running. Uh, what we do for Java, for .NET, for PHP, for Node.js, for actually pretty much every technology we support is only one library that you need to install on that machine. We are using uh, official interfaces for Java, for instance. We do we hook we hook into the JVM TI interface. That's a tooling interface that allows us, without any code modification, to instrument code for you and get this level of visibility. So there's no code change necessary. That's a nice thing, yeah. But that's true for I would say for most tracing tools. Maybe the only difference is that we've been around for a little longer and we have a very big coverage of technologies. Um, but yeah, I think all of the tool vendors want to make it as easy as possible. No code change. Uh, yeah.
Mm -hmm. So the question is, we capture a lot of data, and it's if we have any numbers on how much does it cost to store this data, right? So first of all, I would say most of our clients install Dynatrace on-premise, meaning in their own data center. That means they actually capture and store the data on the local environments. That means they own storage. And uh, we also have to say we don't store every single little bit of detail forever. We have a rolling window. So typically what we do, we have two types of storage. The raw data that goes down to the method. We keep this typically for a week or two. So the idea is something happened on the weekend and somebody comes in on Monday and you still have the data available. Or maybe you want to keep something and compare one week to another really deep down. Then you want to keep it for two weeks. Right? We have customers that analyze uh, really large volumes. So we have, I think, the top nine or the top nine or nine out of the top 10 e-commerce providers in the US use us. So we have some really high numbers, yeah? Um, so storage typically is never an issue, especially with a rolling window. And what we then do, the charts that I showed you, this is stuff that we store separately in a relational database. And then we also do data aging. So like data that is a year old, we then, we don't keep it in one minute interval, but like in 10 minutes a day, whatever it is. Yeah. And therefore, storage is typically no problem. We also provide this as a SaaS offering, um, but I think the storage, I mean, then we cover the costs in this case, right? And, and pricing, I mean, I, I don't want to go into a pricing discussion because that's not what we're here for. If you want to, if you are interested in, I'm sure we can talk later, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so the, the question is, to, do we also simulate users? Because our main bread and butter is to be actually monitor real users, but we can, int we can we have two things. We, we have our own, what we call synthetic monitoring offering. So we have different points around the world where we can say, I want to execute 500 users from here and here and here using that browser and clicking through that. But we also are very open and integrate with any other load testing or monitoring solution. But we also provide our, our own service for that, yeah. But the key is we monitor normally end use, real end users, yeah. Mm -hmm. So typically, the biggest challenge is often to actually get, so the question, if I rephrase it, the question is how long does it typically take in an enterprise environment to deploy such a solution, right? So that means, um, yeah, so that really depends. Uh, the installation itself, it takes probably a couple of minutes to install the software on its own. The challenge is typically to get the ports open because we obviously need to communicate from your JVMs, your CLRs, to a central component that we call the Dynatrix server. You also need to make sure in big enterprises, if they install everything on premise to just you know provide the hardware that is needed with a, a calculation guide on, if you say I have a hundred JVMs or a thousand JVMs and this is the volume, then we give you recommendations on which hardware you should use. Um, the deployment itself, we provide Sheffet, Puppet, Ansible script, so the, the deployment is a is really not a whole lot. More effort later on goes into uh, maybe building additional dashboards because every application is different. So you may want to see different things in your application that I want to see in my application. We have some pre-configured sets that typically work extremely well. Um, with, I think we provide startup guides where we, we, we have you up and running in a, in a couple of days. Uh, we also, I mean, if you want to look at what we do, go on YouTube and, show and, and, and watch me how I install stuff. But I know it's different a little bit at the big enterprise. But, uh, yeah. It looks more complicated as it is, than it is. Yeah. We've been around for a while. We've figured this out. If there are any risks uh, involved in the installation process, 
Well, the installation is one library, and then you need to load that library in. Of course, I mean it's it's it doesn't come for free. First of all, right? We have overhead. Uh, we open we talk open about it. Typically, between one and two percent overhead. That's what you get as an answer. The answer comes standard from any APM vendor. Um, but the thing is, first of all, you need the visibility because otherwise you fly blind, right? You said you can't improve what you can't measure, what you don't measure, that's first of all. And then typically we see huge performance improvements after you actually see how bad your code is and then you start fixing it, but you've never seen it before. So normally the net overhead is negative, right? as strange as it sounds. Um, and if you, if, you look, if you go to the website, you can see customer testimonials that range from small to very big enterprises, and they use it in very large environments. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Of course, no, no, I mean, installing it must be planned, especially, typically, it's when they have maintenance windows, right? And you don't need to install everything on all of your hundreds or thousands of JVMs at once. If you have like a rolling update window where you as a company does updates, you can start with the first hundred, then with the next hundred agents. And so you add more and more to it. It's also possible. Eh? Mm -hmm. Who is going home tonight and tomorrow thinks about how can I monitor my number of database statements that I execute? Nobody? Come on. Maybe you do this already. Yeah. Well, think about think about this concept of of not only looking at performance but also at resource efficiency. Like really trying to track how many database statements to execute, how many lines of log messages to write in my feature, how many of them are actually bullshit and nobody needs them, and it's just filling up space. There's another. Also, sorry for the wording for the language, but I, I one of the exercises I sometimes do with with companies. I look at the log files after a load test or take it from production and then I sit down and we mark all the logs that are not needed at all. And then we realize that a lot of logs are just written because we can, but are not useful. And they are basically costing you network, they're costing you storage, and if you don't have an enterprise license for Splunk, you also need to pay them or whoever is, whatever you're using. So that's why I try to educate people to start tracking resource utilization, resource usage per feature that you built over time. And then you showed it in your screenshot where we, where we, where we baseline individual metrics from build to build, and then you can immediately see if a code change has a negative impact. Good. One, two, three, I'm done. Just hello. Uh, just a few last words. Uh, first of all, thanks to our presenters. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, the pizza is here. Uh, on your way for the pizza, you can grab a beer from the fridge. And also, for those of you who filled in the questionnaires, please put them in the bowl, and we'll have a raffle later on, so you can pick some uh, prizes from us. Uh, thank you for attending. Enjoy the pizza and beer and and some soft drinks as well. Thank you.